History has witnessed many catastrophic events, some resulting from forces of nature and others from human action. They have included droughts, famines, floods, fires, pandemics, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunamis, and other disasters. While the type of calamities have not changed much, the ways in which people have prepared for, responded to, and recovered from emergencies have evolved over time. Welcome to this lesson on emergency management. Current practices in emergency management are based in part on a variety of standards, guidelines, directives and reference publications. However, there is no single industry standards and no single glossary of terms accepted by all public and private sector organizations. Different references and different organizations may use terms such as emergency management, emergency planning, crisis and emergency management disaster preparedness, disaster recovery, or business continuity. Let's come to the importance of emergency management. Unexpected emergencies and contingencies occur with dismaying regularity. When a disaster or other emergency strikes, many decisions must be made while the event is still unfolding and the true dimensions of the situation are unknown. While some decisions will affect the health of the organization, for many years, others may have an immediate effect on its ability to survive. An emergency can over overwhelm those who have done no planning or preparations. People do not want to believe that bad things could happen to them or their environments. Emergency management has taken on greater importance in the 21st century as businesses have been victims of floods, earthquakes, hurricanes and other natural disasters. Those events in conjunction with such highly publicized attacks as computer hacking, workplace violence, September 11, 2001 like events, terrorist attacks have demonstrated the need for effective emergency management. Even with planning, it is necessary to improvise and remain flexible when a disaster or other emergency strikes. Planning in advance of an emergency is essential. During an emergency, one should expect confusion and an interruption of communication links. Conditions may be chaotic. An emergency plan should enable those responsible for recovery to focus on solving major problems. Because responding promptly to an emergency may prevent it from causing substantial loss. An emergency plan should provide the basis for orderly actions and for making decisions that minimize losses. The logical beginning of emergency management is the development of a plan that does the following. It defines emergency in terms relevant to the organization. It, establish, it, it establishes an organization to perform specific tasks before during and after an emergency, establishes a method for using available resources and for obtaining additional resources at the time of an emergency, provides a means for moving normal operations into and back out of the emergency mode of operation. Elements of Emergency Management The four elements of emergency management are mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery. Mitigation. Mitigation actions involve lasting, often permanent, reduction of exposure to, probability of or potential loss from hazard events. They tend to focus on where and how to build. Mitigation can also involve educating businesses and the public on simple measures they can take to reduce loss and injury, like fastening bookshelves and file cabinets to walls to keep them from falling during earthquakes. Also by educating employees on the simple rule of duck cover and hold if inside a building during an earthquake. Preparedness 
this aspect of emergency management encompasses actions taken before an event to plan organize equip train and exercise in order to deal with emergencies that cannot be avoided or entirely mitigated response this element entails the implementation of the emergency plan to deal with the short term effects of the event response may include incident identification emergency notification activation and deployment of emergency teams and evacuation of personnel recovery this aspect involves near term and long term actions taken to return the organization to a pre emergency level of operation or in some cases to a new level of operation recovery efforts may include implementation of continuity of operations or business resumption plans activation of emergency relocation sites and reconstitution or restoration at the original location or a new permanent location hello students in the past two chapters i have told you the very basics of emergency management going forward we will talk in question and answer form where i will ask you a question and you can guess the answer i will try to explain the topic to you in question answer form so starting with our first question the question is the first priority in a sound disaster control plan should be protection of equipment and material that will be used in the disaster recovery effort restoration of normal operations protection of human life establishment of communications now you have to understand uh, what a sound disaster control plan priority should be or an emergency plan priority should be so out of this four uh, what do you think is the highest priority or the top priority for any management to take decision upon so the correct answer is protection of human life because human life is the most important thing we look at in any kind of disasters any kind of emergencies this is a thing which has to be on top priority and has to be kept in mind while creating any kind of plans emergency plan business continuity plan disaster management plan so the next question is which of the following is not a function of the disaster control plan or the emergency management plan define emergency and disaster in terms relevant to the organization or develop a new organization to control emergency situations superseding the operating organization within the enterprise or establish a method for utilizing resources on hand and for obtaining additional resources at the time of a emergency or provide a recognizable means for moving normal operations into and back out of the disaster mode of operations so which is the correct answer so the correct answer for this is develop a new organization to control emergency situations superseding the operating organization within the enterprise if you would have read the question correctly it says which of the following is not a function of the disaster control plan so everything else is a function of disaster control plan whereas this is not a function of disaster control plan or the emergency management plan you will not develop a new organization to control emergency situations the existing organization which is already handling the day to day activities will be responsible so a new organization will not be created so the next question is the public relations segment of a disaster plan should provide for or you can say the communication plan should provide for a use of the term no comment in dealing with media representatives until a complete investigation of the situation has been completed b release of information through only one person who can be unavailable as needed c 
immediate response to media inquiries through prepared press releases and verbal briefings or d prohibition of any response to media inquiries unless specifically authorized by the chief executive officer of the organization the correct answer for this will be c immediate response to media inquiries through prepared press releases and verbal briefings here what we need to understand is communication is the most important key for any organization in disaster moment so let me tell you something out here communication is of two kinds one is internal uh, where you communicate to your internal stakeholders employees and the other is external where you communicate to the media or external agencies some things to be kept in mind while communicating externally this has to be done before a disaster strikes it's to build communication capacity prior to a disaster including pre-written public service announcements in multiple languages on questions that frequently arise during disasters maintaining a database of statistics for different regions and types of disasters maintaining lists of locally trusted sources of information for frequently affected countries and regions maintaining email lists of employees international media outlet contacts and government and non-government organization that can be used to rapidly disseminate information so the next question is a mutual aid association is a cooperative organization of a businesses and organizations required by statute to assist each other in emergencies b businesses and organizations united by a voluntary agreement to assist each other in emergencies c labor unions with members in organizations that have agreed to assist each other in emergencies or d businesses and organizations in the same general field of endeavor who have agreed to assist each other in emergencies so as the name suggests mutual aid association it itself tells you the meaning the answer is b businesses and organizations united by a voluntary agreement to assist each other in emergencies now these kind of organizations are very good because in an area where disaster strikes these organizations can help each other to come out of these crises very quickly the next question is an emergency planning exercise a normally covers all aspects of a particular emergency plan b is conducted primarily to check the workability of an emergency plan c should be as key to the actual plan as much as possible subject to safety considerations or d should always involve emergency response agencies outside the organization the answer to this is c should be as key to the actual plan as much as possible subject to safety consideration now what we have to understand out here is the emergency exercise scenario involves proposing a sequence of events to assess the effectiveness of the emergency planning arrangements and the responses of all persons and organizations having responsibility in an emergency so if you understand this then you will understand this answer let's do some more question answer to understand things better so the next question is disaster plans should be evaluated and modified if necessary a after each training drill b after each emergency c when responsibilities have changed or d all of the above the answer to this question is d all of the above so basically disaster plans or emergency plans are supposed to be live documents so after each training drill after any emergency or if the responsibilities have changed or any kind of change which has happened on ground these documents should be changed and should be live the next question is in planning for emergency medical services planner should assume that in house medical support will be available to respond to an emergency b plan only for mass casualty situations c rely on local emergency services 
to provide necessary emergency medical transport or d first ascertain the kind and scope of any in-house medical support the answer to this question is d first ascertain the kind and scope of any in-house medical support generally you will understand your internal capabilities first and then only fall on to external elements question which of the following would not be productive in organizing a volunteer auxiliary facility protection and fire brigade a designate the employees who are to participate b provide instruction which benefits the employees at home as well as on the job c conduct training sessions during paid time d provide training in actual fire fighting as you would have read the question properly it says following would not be productive so if you go through the answer the answer is a designate the employees who are to participate basically this has to be a voluntary force and designation of any employees in this won't help the next question is the emergency preparedness planning process a begins with requirements and ends with the preparation of the plan b is a continuing process as long as the plan exists c does not normally include training and testing those tasked with responsibilities under the plan or d is a desirable but not an essential part of effective planning the answer to this is b is a continuing process as long as the plan exists as i told you before the emergency plan is a live document so the process will always be continuing till the time plan exists which of the following is not likely to be a responsibility of the organization's crisis or emergency management team a assigning individuals to perimeter security posts b preparing appropriate press releases regarding the incidents covered under a contingency plan c coordinating implementation of appropriate contingency plans or d coordinating with internal and external agencies as required answer to this question is a assigning individuals to perimeter security posts now what we need to understand is organization's crisis or emergency management team is a very strategic level team they assign tasks to different departments and those departments get down to tactical level to do, do those tasks now this task which is mentioned in a is supposed to be done by the security department so directly the emergency management teams won't look into it let's talk about objectives of emergency management emergency management has three primary objectives the first is to minimize the probability of a threat or emergency this may be possible with human or accidental threats however it is not achievable with natural threats such as hurricanes tornadoes and snowstorms the second objective is to mitigate the impact if the event occurs the final equally important objective is to recover from the emergency and resume normal operations the two key elements necessary to achieve the objectives are what is to be done and who is to do it an effective tool for determining the probability of a threat or a disaster and its impact on an organization is to conduct a risk analysis in the development stage of the emergency plan now we will talk about planning in crisis management planning is a very important aspect of crisis management by their very nature crises are hard to predict we don't know when they will happen or what form they will take but we can know how we will respond when they strike provided we take the time to create an effective crisis management plan and share the information with all relevant stakeholders some of the things which we will talk about is the definition when to plan why to plan the impact and the financial impact so let's start with the definition a crisis management plan involves the development of a comprehensive process designed to help the organization handle a potentially catastrophic event 
minimizing the disruption to business operations and lowering the risk of harm to employees and customers which in turn can prevent damage to its reputation typically a plan will identify potential threats to both the organization and its stakeholders before discussing how each of these threats will be handled internally in a manner which allows the organization to recover quickly primarily by resolving the issue at hand and using information gathered to prevent future occurrence next comes when to plan don't wait until a crisis strikes to establish a management plan as by this time it's too late to think clearly about the processes you want to follow as various stakeholders start clamoring for attention and the situation may gather media attention instead organization should create a crisis management plan in advance even if things are going well and look to involve representatives from every department to ensure every potential issue is considered now why should we plan avoiding unpredictability can be fatal to an organization and its future which is why it's important to plan for a crisis and it can help you both react and respond to crisis quickly and efficiently after all just because something is described as a once in a lifetime event doesn't mean it won't happen even 500 year weather events happen every 500 years therefore it makes sense to create a plan designed to respond to any anticipated crisis so you can manage the situation when disaster strikes the impact if you and your organizations are pre- unprepared for a potential crisis it can have a negative impact on the businesses for weeks months and even years after the event occurred including damage to its reputation disruption to business operations and potential legal issues in fact studies reveal that as a negative news cycle can batter the brand image as mistakes action and inactions are continually examined criticized and broadcast it can take organizations up to 3 years to recover their reputation coming on to the financial toll arguably the biggest impact of a crisis is the financial toll the situation takes on the overall organization studies reveal that a single hour of downtime could cost up to $100,000 depending on the size of the business however a crisis management plan isn't expensive and can help the organization save money if and when a crisis strikes by providing a clear process to follow let's talk about development of the plan management has to be directly involved in the identification and evaluation of the organizational assets as part of the plan development this process will identify the key assets of the organization that need to be protected those managers directly involved in the day to day operations are best to make the task of conducting a risk analysis more manageable the purpose of an emergency plan is to highlight the types of problems that decision makers and other key emergency management personnel will encounter and to require them to consider in advance how to react when an emergency develops now let's come on to the planning process the planning process is critical and often misunderstood far too often if plans are developed at all they are put on the shelf and forgotten for a plan to be effective it must reflect the requirements of the organization to which it pertains furthermore all persons tasked with responsibilities must clearly understand their responsibilities and be trained to fulfill them in addition the plan must be tested through practice and sh- it should be revised in light of such testing an exercise or an actual implementation of the plan may point to the need of revisions reassignment of responsibilities or retraining of personnel after which the plan should be retested the most important thing to remember about planning is that it is a continuing process that is never finished as long as the plan exists
Now let's talk something about assembling a team. A very good team is very important to handle crisis efficiently. Now let's talk about who to be included in the team. Typically, your crisis management team will be led by the CEO or owner of the organization and feature senior executives and department leaders. Although some areas should be given more priority than others, including legal counsel and public relations representatives, as their expertise is essential when a crisis strikes. To ensure you can gather a wide range of information and perspectives, it's a good idea to make your team as diverse as possible by including individuals from across the organizations. Remember, it's easier to slim down the team as progress is made than to add new members at the last minute. Assigning roles. Once the team has been assembled, assign each member an area of responsibility for when a crisis strikes. For example, delivering public statements and investigating the issue. Share this information with everyone in the organization so employees and stakeholders are aware of who to contact in an emergency. It's a good idea to ensure that you know something about everyone else's role as well as your own in case they are unavailable when a crisis occurs with the information helping you to handle surprises as you can see how the tasks fit together to achieve results. Expert advice. As part of the process, it's also a good idea to reach out to experts for their advice, including employees and customers as they can provide a different perspective on the organization and the situation it could face. It's also recommended that you contact communication experts, especially if you don't have an internal PR team, as well as investment bankers, financial planners and lawyers as their expertise could prove invaluable if and when a crisis strikes. During a crisis, you will find the activities of the crisis management team fall into two main categories, resolution and communication. But what does it actually involve? For the, for the resolution team, their responsibilities include identifying the issue by getting someone they trust on the scene to provide a first-hand account of what's happening and act as the public face of the response team, facilitating a problem-solving environment in the process. Once they have identified the problem, they should isolate and contain it to ensure that any operations sitting up or downstream from the situation aren't affected, including preventing the shipment of pro products if appropriate. Now the focus can shift to resolving the crisis by quickly and effectively fixing the problem in a way that's irreversible so the organization can prove to customers that the issue won't be repeated. Finally, whatever happens, don't deny that a crisis is occurring as this can cause the issue to fester and get worse, potentially leading to legal problems and certainly damaging the organization's reputation. One of the most important component of any crisis is crisis communication. Let's talk about crisis communication. Crisis communication can be divided into two parts, internal crisis communication and external crisis communication. We will talk initially about internal crisis communication. First of all, we will have to establish a culture of transparency from the top down. Executives and managers need to maintain open and honest communication with the organization all the time and when giving feedback to employees. Employees should feel comfortable coming forward about any issues that arise on the front line. This will help build trust and ensure your organization learns about problems more quickly. Secondly, we will have to be more proactive. Preparing for crisis ahead of time will help you create internal processes and systems for dealing with crisis effectively. Brainstorming potential issues will also help you prevent crisis from happening in the first place. Test these functions you develop ahead of time to ensure they work properly. Establish an internal notification system. If a crisis occurs, 
communicate what's going on to employees quickly via mail, phone or any other channels. Additionally, your organization should have a central location where employees can find notification about a crisis. Send internal alerts first. Talk to employees about what's going on first before making a public announcement. You have to be consistent. Enhance trust and understanding by being honest and consistent when sharing facts about a crisis. It's important for leaders to be assigned specific roles to create a consistent message. Anticipate employee questions. Employees may assume the worst unless you explain to them the facts candidly. Provide meaningful information that employees need to understand what's happening. Be empathetic. Be sensitive to frontline employees' feelings and concerns, such as fear for the job or their safety. Shape external messaging. No matter how much you would like your employees to stay quiet, it's not going to happen. Instead of trying to stop the inevitable, it's smart to give employees information they can share. Keep communicating throughout the crisis. Create a regular schedule for sending out updates to employees so they stay abreast of new developments. And ultimately, evaluate how you did. What should you do next time? What should you avoid doing? What should you do differently? Now let's talk something about external crisis communication. Public relation or PR nightmares happen all the time. And it's not always because the organization has an unhealthy culture and is acting unethically from top to bottom. Sometimes even when a company has good intentions, bad things happen. And you need to be ready in case that happens to you. Because it very well could. So what do you need to do to communicate externally with the public in the event of a crisis. Anticipate and prepare. It's always best to be proactive rather than reactive. So put together a plan for dealing with any crisis if it occurs. A good starting place is to have a brainstorming session in which employees point out potential crises that could happen at your organization. This allows you to not only prevent crisis by changing current processes and practices, but also start considering how to best respond in the event these things do happen. Create a crisis communication team. It's not enough to plan responses to potential crisis. You need to have a team ready to tackle any issue that arises. So identify key players that could make a positive difference as part of the crisis communications team. We spoke about this uh, in our last few chapters. Select and train spokesperson. When a company is dealing with a public scandal, the last thing it needs is for hundreds of employees to provide their two cents on the situation. That just adds to the chaos and in all likelihood hurts the organization's public image even more. So it's crucial to have designated individuals Members of the crisis communication team be the voice for the organization. Make sure the spokespeople have the right skills for the job. After all, they will likely have to communicate effectively in front of large crowds, in front of a camera, the internet, basically a lot of different ways. So spokespeople have to be thoroughly trained on crisis communication. Not to mention they need to have the knowledge and training to know what to say and how to say it, as well as what not to say when speaking on behalf of the organization. Align systems and processes with crisis communication efforts. The whole point of crisis communication is to communicate crisis to stakeholders. So establish a notification system that will allow your organization to quickly and efficiently reach out to all concerned parties using various modes of communication. You should also create a system to monitor what people are saying about your organization. That way, if something goes wrong, 
you can get an idea of what stakeholders are thinking and feeling in response. That's useful information to know because it will allow you to adjust the crisis communication strategy based on stakeholder feedback. Create holding statements. These are templates with pre-approved messages and blank sections where more specific information can be inserted in the event of a crisis. Obviously, you can't know exactly what to say in response to a crisis before an issue has even occurred. But you can at least have some text prepared. Think of all the potential crises you identified in the first step. What responses might you say if those occur? This will help you respond more quickly and thoughtfully if something bad happens. Handle the crisis. This is when you assess the situation by rapidly learning what the problem is, how and why it happened, who it will affect and so on. Then you will have to figure out how to best respond. Since you already have your holding statements established, all you have to do is add details to make them more specific and relevant to the issue at hand and adopt this messaging for each medium used to convey the information. For instance, the statement made on the news will look different from the message you release on Twitter. As you can see, if you have adequately prepared for potential crisis, you should be able to react promptly and meaningfully. Here are some other tips to keep in mind when conducting this step for dealing with a crisis. Respond quickly. With technology today, news travels fast and you have to respond just as rapidly to prevent people from assuming that you are guilty or incompetent. But don't be so quick to respond that you say something insensitive, inaccurate or otherwise negative. Speed is key but shouldn't come at the expense of the message itself. Be honest and transparent. If you are dealing with a peer crisis, you are already in a bad place with the public. Don't make things worse by fudging the facts or hiding information. That just makes you look guilty. Instead, be upfront with people and openly address the issue at hand. That will help renew people's trust in your organization. Take appropriate responsibility. If your organization's action in any way brought about the issue you are facing, it's important to own up to it and apologize. By deflecting blame to someone else, it sounds like you are making excuses, not holding yourself accountable for your part in the problem. This not only undermines the sincerity of an apology you release, but also shifts the focus from victims, the people who are really hurting, to you. And that's definitely not the right direction to go. Be consistent. Make sure all statements and actions by the organization support one consistent PR message. Otherwise, the public will get mixed signals from the organization, which might break down any confidence they still had in your brand. One way to ensure your company-wide message is consistent is to train employees on what to say and what not to say in the event of a crisis. Leverage supporters. When you are dealing with PR nightmare, chances are the public isn't going to take what you have to say as seriously as you would like. But if you have strong supporters who defend your brand in times of crisis, it can bolster the sincerity and power of your message, especially if your supporters aren't directly affiliated with your organization. So be sure to cultivate a community of supporters before any issues arise by providing value, tending to stakeholder needs and engaging your audience. Finally, Evaluate your crisis communication efforts. After your organization has navigated crisis situation, it's important to analyze what worked and what didn't. What did you learn from your experiences? What can you do better or differently next time? Even though you hope to never encounter a crisis, they do present a learning opportunity. Take advantage of it. Crises are never fun to deal with, but with the right preparation, and processes, you can be sure to deal with crisis as quickly and effectively as possible. Let's go through some more questions on emergency management. So coming to the first question, 
employees should be advised that the safest place during an earthquake is a in a company owned vehicle b in the center of the company parking lot c generally within the work area under pre selected cover or d usually in the company cafeteria so the answer will be c generally within the work area under pre selected cover during an earthquake you won't have so much time to move out the earthquake lasts only for a minute or 2 minutes so you have to make sure that you take cover immediately coming to the next question the main functions of the security force during a strike are a prevent injury and damage preserve the work site and maintain order b control access enforce the law and identify troublemakers c protect vehicular traffic prevent entry by strikers apprehend law breakers or d patrol the perimeter log all vehicles and prevent mass picketing so the answer will be a prevent injury and damage prevent the work site and maintain order this will be the primary responsibility of a security force let's come to the next question the basic premise for planning entry points to a facility in a strike situation should be a the fewest entries possible consistent with the realistically estimated operating status b the maximum entries possible in order to maximize distribution of the striking force c a single entry point to the facility regardless of facility size or the number of personnel authorized entry to the facility or d a maximum of 3 entries to the facility regardless of the size of the facility so the answer is pretty simple uh, most of the security professionals would have guessed by now the fewest entries possible consistent with the realistically estimated operating status to avoid confusion in a strike situation direction to the security forces on the line and in fluid field situation should come only from the a senior company executive at the facility b security organization c local law enforcement agency or d senior facility maintenance person so again uh, the answer is pretty simple it's security organization the next question is the most important single external relationship during a strike is with a national union leadership b local union leadership c local fire department or d local police organization the answer is d local police organization in documentary coverage of a strike situation it is important to a document all activities of the striking personnel b refrain from documenting strike activities that include involvement with local police c refrain from documenting legal activities but to document illegal activities as fully as possible or d refrain from documenting activities that include involvement with security personnel the answer is c refrain from documenting legal activities but to document illegal activities as fully as possible now coming to the final leg of our lecture crisis recovery once the crisis has passed it's important for organizations to assess what happened looking at how the crisis management plan was implemented what worked and what didn't so that lessons can be taken from the situation and applied to future scenarios armed with this information the team can revisit the plan and reevaluate the processes they put in place removing any deemed unnecessary and making adjustments to those which didn't work 
as intended. In fact, studies show that organizations who experience a crisis tend to become the ones most eager to avoid a similar situation in the future, with 90% of businesses conducting internal reviews to reveal how and why the crisis occurred and whether it could have been prevented or better yet avoided. Hope you would have liked the lecture. Thank you.